If you decide to recreate anything, it is at your own risk, and I do not accept the responsibility. Make sure you press the follow button on my Instagram, as if you were my ex pushing my buttons. Sodium amide is a very basic inorganic salt, and it's very useful in a lot of reactions. It is mainly used as a strong base in organic synthesis. One wildly known reaction is the deprotonation of alkynes. When not being used as a base, it's also an excellent nucleophile. Watch this funny meme. Another popular reaction is the elimination reaction of geminal and vicinal dihalides. This yields alkynes, which is also very useful in organic synthesis. Geminal dihalides are essentially both halogens on one carbon, and vicinal are halogens on one adjacent carbon to each other. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with sodium amide, however, it's going to be using some of the same reagents that we're going to use to make it. Sodium amide is quite easy to make, and we just need sodium metal, liquid ammonia, and a catalyst. The birch reaction has additional reagents, like an alcohol and an aromatic ring. In this case, benzene is reduced to a diene. To start, we're going to need a 500 milliliter beaker with a stir bar inside. We need an ammonia source, so I'm going to be reacting urea and sodium hydroxide together. So to start, I added 120 grams of sodium hydroxide into the flask. Next, we're going to add 90 grams of urea, and we're going to put that inside there too. I'm not going to add the water yet until I have my dry ice bath. This is because I just want to get this set up before I do anything else. I constructed a distillation setup, and I put some potassium hydroxide in the condenser. For the vertical condenser, I used a gram condenser, as I've never used it before. I put potassium hydroxide into the condenser, as this will selectively pull water out of the ammonia gas. We need the gas to be dry, so we have anhydrous ammonia. This was connected to a long drip tube that was inside of a test tube. The entire test tube was placed into a wine cooler that was made of stainless steel. We're going to use this as a dry ice bath holder, and we're going to condense all the ammonia gas that comes over into a liquid. I tried to find a drip tube that mostly went down the test tube, but this is what I had to work with. What you're about to witness is one of the greatest mistakes that I've ever made in my channel's history. Other than having cringy humor that I'm very self-aware of, this has to take the cake. I should have started by adding the dry ice into the bottom of the wine cooler, and then adding the acetone in. I totally did this to show you what not to do, and not me being a dumbass. You can see these giant dry ice chunks, and I'm going to put one in there. Just watch the horror. Since acetone has a much higher heat capacity than air, it sublimes the dry ice a lot quicker and a lot of CO2 is given off. I had to air my garage out as so much acetone was in the air. Once everything settled down, I eventually added more dry ice and I finally got it to negative 78 degrees Celsius. Once this was ready, I was ready to move on. With that, 200 milliliters of distilled water was added to the reaction flask. The funny thing about this heating mantle is it doesn't stir, so I just used the stir bar as an anti-bump protocol. Once the water was added, I cranked up the heat, and we have a boil going. The sodium hydroxide in urea is reacting and creating ammonia gas. I actually cranked the heat up too much, and a lot of water was making its way up the tube. Actually, there was so much water vapor going up the tube, I ran into a big problem. There was so much water erupting out of the top of the gram condenser that I was worried about it going over the horizontal condenser. I had to turn the heat down, but luckily no water made it over. The ammonia gas that's being liberated out of the reaction flask is being dried by the potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide is highly hygroscopic, and it attracts and holds water molecules from the surrounding environment. I put this piece of tape around the test tube, but it really wasn't doing anything. It was mostly just used as a delusional safety control, even though it wasn't doing anything. With the heating turned down, it was a very relaxed reflux, and I didn't have the water problem anymore. While I was waiting for my ammonia to condense, I actually got my sodium metal ready. I have my sodium metal stored in mineral oil, and I'm going to use some heptane to remove the oil. This is the heptane that I got from a previous video, where I separated ether and heptane from starting fluid. I cut off a small piece of sodium metal, as I really didn't know how much I needed for the reaction. You can see this shiny layer of the sodium before it oxidizes. 
Again, to wash off all the mineral oil, all I did was put it in the heptane and swirl the beaker around. I'm also going to store the sodium in the heptane until I'm ready to use it. I also decided to wash my knife with a little bit of the heptane. After letting the reaction run for some time, I decided to check how much ammonia we got. Turns out, we got a lot of it. Such a beautiful, non-dangerous looking liquid, but it's actually really dangerous. One, it's very corrosive to your tissue, and you can get frostbite from it. I actually had a very big issue with frosting of the test tube, and it was very hard to see inside. This pissed me off because I wanted to show the beautiful blue color when you throw sodium in there. Unfortunately, we are going to be stuck with the frost view of this. Upon the addition of the sodium metal, we can see this beautiful blue color being liberated out of the solution. The blue color is actually solvated electrons. Ammonia's liquid lattice has enough space for electron to just chill there. Sodium metal can donate an electron and ammonia doesn't have to pick it up, resulting in our blue solution. The camera doesn't do justice and seeing this phenomenon in person was quite phenomenal. I let things just go on, and you can see that the solution eventually takes on a full blue color. I was trying to melt the frost with my hand, but every single time I put my hand around it, the ammonia would boil quite rapidly. Before I added any more sodium, we actually need a catalyst. Now, we still could make sodium amide without a catalyst, but the ferric chloride will actually help speed it up a lot. We need iron in a 3 plus oxidation state, and this is where we can get it from the ferric chloride. I didn't know how much to add, so I just threw in a little spoonful. I didn't want to add too much, as this would contaminate it a lot more. I just want to show how annoying the frosting problem is, and it condensed so much water around it that you couldn't really see inside of it. Ammonia likes to be a gas at room temperature, and you can see that the liquid ammonia really wants to be a gas. I tried to scrape as best as I could, so I could show you what the color looks like inside the test tube. It was very annoying because seconds after I scraped it, it would already frost over. I'm not sure how long I scraped, but it was quite a long time. I kept adding small pieces of sodium and seeing what happened. I didn't know exactly how much I needed, but I just added until I felt it was right. Any extra sodium should be pretty easy to separate from the sodium amide. Here, after I scraped the sides of the test tube, you can see the boiling ammonia. After scraping it for some time and taking a picture, you can see the beautiful dark blue solution of liquid ammonia. Well, of course with the solvated electrons in there. I wanted to show the sodium amide production and I put my glass rod in there. As the ammonia boils off, we can see our sodium amide start to be a lot more present. Some of the white powder can appear to be gray and this is because of the iron contamination. I think it's so surreal to see this in real time and watch the blue color disappear. Unfortunately, sodium amide reacts with the moisture in the air quite quickly and you need to make sure that you can put this in a container. Here's some of the scraped off sodium amide and it looks quite beautiful. Mine is slightly gray due to the iron contamination, but pure is pretty white. After all the liquid ammonia evaporated, we're left with this gray solid. We can also see a little bit of sodium metal at the bottom that never ended up reacting. It seems I put too much sodium in. There was still a little blue in the test tube, but it eventually went away. I had to work quickly to get all the sodium amide out of the test tube as it reacts with the moisture in the air like previously stated. The powder actually kind of looks like the moon's surface to me and it's really cool. Unfortunately, I never weighed the sodium amide and I overexposed the shot. I was also very careful not to scrape the sodium metal out, and this should be pretty pure. We want to be careful not to breathe any of the dust in, and I immediately put it into a container. I stored this in an amber glass vial, but it really doesn't need to be in an amber glass one. It really just needs to be protected from the outside air. A good idea would be to store this under an inert gas. I decided to go with argon as that's what I had handy. They actually sell argon in these wine preservers that you can buy on Amazon. Thank God for all the alcoholics and wine enthusiasts. The argon being heavier than oxygen will displace the air and a layer of argon will be over our sodium amide. I just had to be careful not to blow the argon too hard. I didn't calculate weight or yield as I just wanted to see if this worked. 
Please don't shun me as a chemist. Cleanup is actually insanely easy, and I just throw some water in there. You can see it immediately dissolve, and the sodium metal will also react with water and make it easy to clean up. If you guys get me to 100k subs, I'll drink this right now. Sodium amide decomposes rapidly with water, and it creates ammonia and sodium hydroxide. Supposedly it's supposed to decompose violently, but I really never saw that. Alright, see you later my degenerates, and we're all on the same list right now, and that means the DEA list. Ape strong together. Huge thank you to all my Patreon supporters, you guys are the MVPs, and I really cannot thank you enough for all of your support.